Netflix flash. Heard that? My life's like a movie. Cause mama keep falling in love. My life's like a movie. And I'ma keep smoking and drugs. My life's like a movie. Ow. She fucks with nothing but the us. My life's like a movie. Welcome back to the Watch So Series Podcast. Brandon and Rashani and Devin are back to uh, for another review today. And today we are reviewing uh, Sorry to Bother You, uh, the first film by Boots Riley. Uh, in an alternative present day version of Oakland. Oops. I didn't mean to hit that. In an alternative present day version of Oakland, telemarketer Cassius Green discovers the magical key to professional success, propelling him into a... Mac- Macabre Universe. Uh, so this is going to be an interesting review because uh, Rashari didn't really get all the hype for this movie. So let's just start with you. Uh, what did you think about this film? Let's keep it 100. There's movies that are good in their own right. Okay? There's movies that are serviceable. There's movies that are fantastic. Just like music. Just like people. There's TV shows. Same thing. But nothing helps a movie more or a TV show or a song more than buzz. You know what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. all it takes is one person to walk out of that movie and send a, a, a tweet or a, a status post or something like that saying such and such was phenomenal. If they're high enough status and they say such and such phenomenal and it's a movie like this, which is kind of avant avant-garde, you know, kind of off the beaten path, it could be looked at as 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 art, really. Um, once somebody says this movie's phenomenal, everybody else got to follow suit, or else it's oh, you just didn't get the nuances of this movie, oh, or yeah. you just didn't you didn't see what happened here in this movie. So everybody comes out like that, like the emperor's got on clothes, and that's the problem with uh, social media and movies. I know that we do movie reviews. I know we're in a social media in- environment, but everybody wants to be inside that circle of saying I thought it was hot too. I thought it was great. Well, what part did you think was really hot about it? Well, (laughs) so honestly, and you know, I got to keep it 100. I thought it was a good movie. I just didn't think it was everybody. Niggas is comparing it to Get Out, dog. Come on. It's not. It's not at that level. It was good, but it was really a I, I, I I appreciate the fact that it was filmed in Oakland or that it was supposed to be in Oakland. No, it was filmed in Oakland. Was, this was a um, artsy movie. I put this movie at the same place where I put Kicks. I put Gook. I put movies like that. Movies that would have been smaller movies if they didn't have the... This movie would have been one of those smaller movies if it didn't have these big names in it. I mean, That's about it. some would get out, though. If we're yeah. being honest. True. If the Very if the true. white critics didn't show up and say I love this shit, that movie would not have had all the hype that it got, and it wouldn't Real have had as high as ratings it got, even though it was great. Like, and, I'm, and I'm sure that there's people who will walked out and get out and were like, I don't see what the big deal. There was, was. a ton of Mostly people who white. didn't get it, and most people called them racist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's like you want to walk that fine line of saying this movie was a good movie. But it wasn't, when it's all said and done years from now, I'm not going to put this movie up against the best movies I ever saw in my life. No, no. Uh, see, here's the thing. I thought this movie was fantastic. <laughs> I, I I, do put this up with Get Out because I think a lot of people are going to, I'm not saying you, but I think a lot of people are going to be like you, not critics, but like people. I think a lot of people are going to be like you because it was weird. And because it was so weird, I think that people people get... I'm not going to say people don't get the message. The message was clear in the film. I think anybody with a reasonable sense of understanding got the message of the film. But I think some of the weirdness and quirkiness in the straight-up sci-fi at the end of the film is going to take away from why I really think this film is great. And I'll get into that in a little bit, but uh, that's just my basic thing. Devin, what do you think? Um... Going into it, I I, I had no ex- expectations because all I seen was just sorry to bother you, and and I knew Lakeith was in uh, was the star of it. Um, I was definitely uh, thrown into to to a lot just 
I didn't know if it was a Spike Lee joint. I didn't know because I, I know I did yeah, all the, the, the references to, to being pro black and shit. And then I was like, well, is it a is it a period piece? Like as far as like it's gonna be a cult classic as far as the time, you know, age of the times. And then I was like, well, is it satire? Because it's, it's, it's satire like all day, you know what I mean? So like it was hard to categorize this movie, but uh, the overall theme I got from it was just like pay attention, stay woke, man. Like and these messages come in different forms, and we gotta wake up, you know. So it was cool. Um, I definitely loved. Just I I enjoyed it. It was definitely entertaining. Um, as far as the plot and everything and just the way they were went about, you know, telling the story. Um, and then who doesn't put the white boys on? So, I mean, it's it's definitely relatable for for us. I mean, it's black men. Uh, so I, I definitely have to put white boys on. This movie stars, somehow, so one of the cool, funniest things about this film is I have no idea how Boots Riley got all these people to be in his movie. Uh, right. But I just looked this guy up and oh my God, yeah, like, how can this he guy? He got Lakeith Stanfield, the main character, along with Tessa Thompson, uh, Mari Hardwick from um, Power. Power, Terry Crews is in this movie, Danny Glover's in this movie, Stephen Young from uh, Glenn from Walking Dead's in this movie, Arnie Hammer's in this movie, and then some voiceovers. You have uh, Patton Oswalt, Forrest Whitaker, uh, Rosario Dawson. Forrest Whitaker was in, he was in the actual movie. I, I saw him in one scene. Well, David no, Cross. no, you didn't. He was the horse. He was the horseman. Um, so you might have thought you saw him, but that wasn't him. No. He was the horseman. Uh, Rosario Dawson played some voices in this film. So there was a lot of voice acting in this film, a lot of actors in this film. It was very good. So the basic story of this film, uh, we talked about it at the top as the synopsis, but basically it's this guy who's kind of down his luck, and he goes for this job interview to work at the telemarketer place, and he basically gets this job doing telemarketing, calling people, selling shit, and he works his way up by uh, get developing this white voice, become this power caller, but he's t- trying to confront all these other things that mess with his conscience as he goes along. It's basically a general synopsis, but we'll get into a little bit more detail about this. But, One question, guys. Did you guys know this motherfucker, Boots Riley, was a rapper? Yeah. yeah, he was with the Coop. Yeah, he was in a group. Who, 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 who the fuck is... The, the Coop is best known. They were a group from like the early, uh, the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, best known for having... A album cover that depicted the uh, World Trade Center being hit by an airplane. Oh shit! Right before it happened. That's so scary. literally right before 9/11 happened, they had that uh, album cover and they had to stop it. They were they were in the same realm as the hieroglyphics, um, uh, Charlie Tuna. Uh, just you know. We're gonna say conscious rap. We're gonna say yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay. Off the beaten path. Yeah. Diggable planets. Yeah, and Boots, he wrote this film. He said he started writing this film about five years ago. And, I believe it. Uh, some of the things in this film that he originally had, he had to take out because he, at the time, wrote it as to be... part Things in this film that we'll talk, we'll talk about, it, but things in this film are very, like, to the extreme to some of, the, uh, some of the parts and some of the things that he wrote that he thought was extreme when he first started writing actually like happened in real life so he had to take it out and change it with some other things I was reading some interviews from him when he was talking about um, how this film came to be um, but yeah so let's just get right into this so basically um, what would you think about uh, Lakeith Stanfield's performance in this film uh, I'll go, uh, I, I thought it was it was masterfully done like the way their chemistry with him and Tess Tessa Thompson, like, um, that shit was great. Um, it, it, like, it, it kind of embodied black love for me. Um, and then him being like, I, I kind of would have been the same person in this situation. So, like, that's how I was like, it's a great performance because I would have played it the same way. I'm like, well, I'm getting this money. I can save my uncle's house. <laughs> you know, uh, I wish y'all, but I'm definitely going to be on the sidelines. I'm getting this money. Uh, Rashadi, what do you think? I've always thought Lakeith was an understated actor. Um, Like, I always thought that his humor was right underneath the surface, like really not dry humor, just like nuanced. Um, And that he would be able to carry a movie like this. I just didn't know he was ever going to get a chance to carry a movie like this. Right. I thought he did wonderfully. Um, I thought that he, I used to work in a call center. 
I worked in the call center where the whole thing was to make sales. I worked in the call center where the whole thing was uh, your your handle time when you were helping people with repairs, but you still had to get sales off, like you had to upsell stuff. I've been in that situation. Um, and so to see him live that life of a person who knows they're only getting paid commission, a person who's, who who needs that money and needs that that success, and the the seeing people who um, are above you, but you're like, they're no better than me. Why are they above you? I, I saw that he carried it perfectly. He walked through that whole movie wonderfully. And, and, and I, I applaud him for it. This is literally something that he can put onto his roster as a possible, uh, Oscar role. Yeah, definitely. Um, this film is absolutely going to get Oscar pushed. I don't know if it's going to get nominated, uh, but it's going to get Oscar push. And what, it's bizarre. Like, I know I kind of felt like he was being Darius without being Darius, though. Like, because I mean, I love Atlanta, but this is kind of way he, how he carries himself as Darius in Atlanta, but you know, with more depth. Mm-hmm. Not so, like, this is Darius if when he had a job. This is Darius moves to Oakland. Yep. Yeah, so basically, uh, his character, I thought he did fantastic as well. Um, his subtleness in his film, his, and I mean, it was very understated, like Rashawn he said and dry, but he did show a lot of range in his film. Uh, from like the the guy that's like down in the dumps because he don't have a job, to the guy that's like faking it till he makes it in a job interview, to the guy that's struggling at work because he don't get it, to the guy that figures out that he's good and is riding it, and to the guy that's like. Riding high and not trying to come back down to being poor anymore, and then to the guy who realizes where he fucked up and how to fix it. Like he 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 goes through a lot of different phases in this film, and each of each one of them is very believable. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, the film basically, you just see this guy and he's like in his garage with Tessa Thompson. By the way, she is fucking fantastic. She like, is. Man, she, right? she, the range of characters that I've seen her play from in in Creed. To Thor Ragnarok, to this film, dear white people, that shit, like, bro, she is like, she can play anything. She is unbelievable because this character that she played in this film is basically like this eccentric, like, I don't even know how to describe her. Like, she's very eccentric. She's kind of like a woke, like, like radical, but at the same time, she's like down to earth girlfriend type, like. She just plays this character with so many ups and downs inside of her. And very well, he's called her a creative. She's a creative, and that, that, she is like, a creative she's... in the film. Uh, so, and... I think one of the reasons why this film is getting so much buzz is because its take on life as it is. So the way I, the reason why I like this film so much is because it's very simple. It's very simple and direct, and, and to some points, it's too direct. Like it's kind of heavy handed with some of his messages. But for the most part, it's very direct in what it's trying to get across. But it does it in such a way that's very, I I guess I could say just like simple but understanding to so many people. Because the whole premise of this movie, from what I gathered, is a lot, a big part of it is, you know, you can be woke, but you could be woke to an extent. But at the end of the day, we live in this society and we have to be able to, to to thrive in this capitalistic society. It was really a tale on capitalism to me. Uh, it was. And yep. how capitalism corrupts, but also that capitalism corrupts us all and there's no avoiding it no matter how woke you think you are. Because at the end of the day, you have family, you have friends, you have to survive and you can be as woke as you want to be, as radical as you want to be, but there's nowhere where you're going to go where you can avoid this capitalism. Uh, so, did you kind of get that vibe, uh, Devin Rashani? I I definitely did. I mean, because it's it's life. And first of all, like everybody makes this like, oh, oh, you're a sellout. People get, oh, you're a sellout. Oh, because you got this high paying job and and you think you're this and that, but you sold your soul to provide for your family. And and some people get lost in tra- translation. Where like, I'm trying to make my American dream, and I don't really give a damn what you really care about. I know that I have these goals and aspirations as far as providing for my family and, and having a life I want. So don't knock me or call me a sellout because I'm doing what I got to do 
and you don't you have a you have an opinion about it, and then that's what it really is. Rashadi, as a father of four, <laughs> thank you, sir. As as a father of four, you realize that at some point in your life, you're gonna have to possibly take steps you didn't think you were going to have to take before. Like, we all talk about what we do in certain situations. Harking back on Kanye saying slavery was a choice. Niggas who don't live it don't have to experience it. They don't have to talk about it. But there's a point in your life where you're like, you know what? I'm tired of struggling. I'm tired of being here. I'm tired of doing the same thing over and over again. And if this opportunity comes up, I'm going to take it. Um, The thing that I felt was a huge just a a, a a constant thing that the that the movie kept reflecting upon was where people took opportunity when they didn't really need the opportunity um like exactly. Tessa uh taking the opportunity to uh work in the call center when she was out when she was Happy, doing sign. yeah, doing the Twirling signs and doing her art, but she came and worked at that call center, which sucked her soul dry. Um, and 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 Dar- I'm, I'm gonna call him Darius, uh, Lakeith, um, going upstairs right in the midst of this uh, protest, and it was actually funny to see him go in there like y'all motherfuckers ain't gonna fire me, you ain't gonna fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, you ain't gonna do nothing <laughs> there. We ain't firing you, dude. And and he, all of a sudden he was like, oh, well, okay then, you know, because all of a sudden it goes from the thoughts of many to the thoughts of you, and I think that's where society is right now. Damn. I did a about this on single simulcast where it was like, yo, we all talk tough, we all talk big until it's until the situation is happening in our area in our city, and then all of a sudden we want peace. We all talk about how we're going to stand together until an opportunity is given that you just can't pass up. And then all of a sudden, what are you going to do? Yeah, I ain't yeah. that dude. I'm definitely not that dude. I'm all, it's I, the, yeah. like, I pers- I've experienced this firsthand, so I can say that I didn't do this in this case, but I've done it in other cases. But it's like I support Black Lives Matter until I'm trying to get home and they shut down that highway that I'm on. And then I'm like, why I'm just trying to get home, man. Let me get home. I support you. What right. the fuck are you doing? All right. You start you start personalizing, you start internalizing it. And but to another extent, like you understand it and I don't you can't in the world that we live in, you can't completely knock it. But even more than what you guys are talking about in this film, what it also explains it what it also goes into is that you can't escape it. So no matter what you think you're doing, that you think you're doing the right thing, that you're doing good, in some way or form you are supporting this system and this negative stuff that you're fighting against, the machine that you're fighting against, right? If I'm out here protesting about how uh, lower treatment of people and wages and all this stuff, but I go home and I FaceTime on my iPhone, what am I really doing, right? Like the iPhone is made by people who get paid less than the people that you're fighting for, right? (laughs) (laughs) If 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 I'm out here talking about like, Treating people unfair, uh, slave labor, but I'm out here wearing Jordans. Like, what? What am I really talking about? So, in this film, it's really basically like, no matter what you do or who you work for, you don't know what they're doing in the background, what these big corporations are doing or supporting. And when you find out, then you have to you have to make this decision: is is it worth me leaving? Because what's the guarantee of wherever else I go that this they're shit not is not going to be supported? Or I'm not right. going to be doing some something similar that's affecting people in a similar manner. Uh, so in this case, in this movie, we'll get can we spoil shit? Spoil shit. In this film, uh, we'll talk about. Well, before we get to that part, we'll talk about this. So as he's a telemarketer, uh, he's they do this really interesting thing. And I like this creative thing that they did is basically him dropping into the rooms of people when he's making the calls. I thought that was really. It was everything. Yeah. And mm-hmm. interesting how they brought that together. I thought that was a really good film. A really good film tactic to give you just basically like lets you get into the mindset of what it's like to be a telemarketer and so you could call somebody and they could just say fuck you and hang up you could call somebody they could be fucking or you could call somebody who's dealing with fucking serious grief and the yeah. and the whole part of this is that the telemarketer the corporation doesn't give a fuck 
So he's he's already immersed into the corporate atmosphere because he wants to get this. He needs to get this money, so he's already internalizing this success to the point that this woman tells her that my my husband is in stage four cancer, stage four cancer. and he's gonna die anytime soon, and we ain't gonna have no money. And he basically flips that into well, we got these books that teach you how to not get cancer, and she's like, bitch, he already got cancer, and I just told you I don't have no money, and starts crying like. And it's this notion that um, that shit probably happens in real life all the time. And so it, it drops down into this bare bones of, like, how ruthless a corporation is. And so then he turns to Danny Glover, who's working next to him, and he's like, look, OG, the OG. look young blood, you ain't making these sales because you ain't putting on your white voice. So then he does this white, what do you mean with this white voice? He's like, you got to put on the white voice. They're not going to listen to you, this black nigga. And then he puts on what he thinks is a white voice. And I, this is another part that I thought was very interesting, and I think that you guys probably got. But I'll, this is one of the things where you know when people are like, "Well, you didn't get this." I think this is something that, especially a lot of white people, but even some black people, aren't going to get. When he was talking about the white voice, and he wasn't talking about it's an idea, just the the pitch of the phone tone of the voice. It's about a mindset. Yeah, he voice. wasn't talking about the s- sound of the white voice or you sounding white. He was talking about. What, the idea of sounding like someone who doesn't have Entitled. a care of the world, someone who's right. not worried about his bills getting paid, someone who's not worried about walking out and getting shot by the police or getting pulled over or dealing with the racist atmosphere or being, a, you know, a straight white man. Or somebody that doesn't need the money. Yeah, I don't need this money. Like, yeah. The, you need to talk with the confidence of a straight white male. Like, people make that thing of all the time. Like, I wish I had the confidence of a straight white male. That's what this. That's what he basically said to him. You go into these calls with the confidence of a straight right male, and you will make that sale. And that's what he did, and he started selling. Uh, but I know we're talking about a lot of deep things, but this movie was also pretty fucking funny because those white Hilarious. voices were fucking tripping me out the whole time. They were tripping me out. So, Rashani, what do you think about uh, him learning how to do the white voice and then making those calls at the white voice? <sighs> See... Here's where the lines diverge. Um, everybody else was laughing about the white voices, and I heard what Danny Glover said. I heard what he said about, and and I'm not saying that like y'all didn't, but I was listening. I, I mean, he said that having a white voice, like not having a care in the world, like after this is all said and done, I'm gonna leave out of here and. Uh, get into my Audi and drive home and drink a scotch, you know, and and all that kind of stuff. I felt that. Like, like just to be able to go into a basketball game and get a hard screen set on you, you call the cops. That's a white voice. (laughs) That is literally a white voice. You know, like, okay, I can do this because why not? That's a white voice. Saying fuck it is a white voice. With that in mind, with that understanding in mind, they didn't have to give him David Cross's voice. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what they made didn't it have funny. to give him a white voice. <laughs> and I realized that they were overdoing it in order to sell the whole trope, the whole right. idea, the whole role. But there's a difference between having a white voice, as Danny Glover described it to him, and acting white. Right. But I don't and think it, Yeah, go ahead. It 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 just that every time that it happened, it just took I mean, I was more on Tessa's side and on Glenn's side, whatever his name was in this movie, Steve, I think. But I was more on their side where they were like, dude, can you stop doing that? You don't have to do that to sound relaxed. You don't have to do that to sound like you don't have a care in the world. And I didn't like that they they gave him that. I got to talk like this voice. Like, And now I don't even want to hear David Cross do any more comedy, which is good. Oh, wow. He ain't he he ain't been funny since Mr. Show and 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 Arrested Development, but that was his voice. So every time I saw it, I was like, "Damn!" Like, I just <sighs> see, I took it differently because I thought they. I agree with what you're saying because you're talking about in principle, but I think right. they gave him the white voice for the exact same reason why you didn't want him to get the white voice. I think they gave him the white voice one for comedy, but two as a plot point to prove that you can do this without sacrificing who you are so basically yeah. they gave him that white voice and they gave mr blank the white voice to show like this is what happens when you completely remove yourself from yourself 
just to make a sale, just to make a profit. You completely change yourself and you lose who you are. And so that's why and so that's why they had the other characters telling him you didn't have to do that, but he continued to do that, which was a point of him going further down the line to where he ended up getting to. But we got to stop. We we glazing over the whole real point. This motherfucker was the chosen one. This is Anakin Skywalker of the white boys right now. Like he mm. he, he was, was the chosen he was one. how he was he was how uh I mean Joiner he was how Joiner he was the next great thing. So I mean he was selling the I, shit out of that stuff too. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. So like when I wasn't mad after that, like because I was like, well, goddamn, he is he's the chosen one, like shit right now because these motherfuckers see that he is the best. He could possibly be the best telemarketer ever. So I was just like, well, I I kind of like you know checked out of all that you know fuck shit you know, for, for us, all the tropes and stuff like that, when I, I like, re- related back to him being the chosen one. So I was like, ah, it, it's funny. And it, it's for comedic purpose. So I it, was okay. It is. It, it, and, and. <sighs> <laughs> I love how you are really internalizing this. I did. I did. I inter because I worked in that sit. I worked in that call center situation. I worked without a union. I worked in all these things where it was like we're not getting paid, but they're getting paid, dude. I worked for Kirby vacuum cleaners. Oh man, that is a, that is a hard demo. That is a hard demo, sir. Exactly, where you know you're struggling just to get through the door to sell a Kirby vacuum cleaner, and the manager or the owner of the shop or whatever's coming yeah. in saying you can get this and showing you a check that has like six zeros and they're driving a Mercedes Benz and all that I've lived in this situation and I felt hopeless like this where you're like I'm living in a garage and I'm struggling and I would have done the white voice I know I would have done the white voice and able to get ahead it's just damn hey man you're making this a compelling ass podcast right this is a whole goddamn uh, review right now this is real right Ooh, it, it, it. This and that's is what why I'm saying I- Exactly what okay. you're saying, Rashani, is why I think this movie is so great. Because everything you're saying is, I think, what they were trying to get at in the film. At least that's mm-hmm. what I took from the film, is everything no, I, you're I, saying. And I feel you. And I took everything that, he, that they were giving. I felt it. I just, I think it was because the same way that folks would go see Saving Private Ryan and be like, that's a great action movie. But folks who were in World right. War One would right. be like, that was, that triggering. was, a, that was triggering. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This even more than skyscraper was triggering for me in a <laughs> jokey way. Yeah, no, I this get it. This was really like everything about it was just like why? Like there was a point where he got invited over to the party, Dang. and they were like, "Can you rap?" Yeah, that's happened to me. That's- me too. <laughs> yeah. And and like I can't rap, and they were like, "You can rap," and it's like I just said I can't rap. You can rap, and then he tries to rap, and it sounds horrible because he can't rap. So he just starts saying, um, "Nigga shit, nigga shit, nigga nigga shit, nigga nigga, 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 shit. nigga, nigga <laughs> shit." And all them white folks start saying it back, and I I I, I right. melted. I, I was like, I man. melted, dog. That's not funny to me. This that's movie true. is a comedy in the same way the bamboozled was a comedy. Wow. That's, that's no, to me, really see, this is where I thought you're. Right this is where I disagree with you in the beginning. This is a comedy in the same way that Get Out was a comedy. That's what it's it was. To, right, Get yeah, Out right. was funny. It was had funny lines. There were people laughing in my theater, but there were parts of that movie that was triggering as fuck watching mm-hmm. that shit. But and there's parts where people are laughing, and you look around, you're like, "Why are you laughing?" That why you laughing? Not funny. Why the fuck right. you laugh? Oh, and yeah, white I, folks are laughing at that nigga shit part, yeah. dog. That shit made me mad. But I was like, oh, my God. And it was like four white people in the room. And here's like, the Yo. thing. The nigga shit thing in a vacuum is funny. Because just saying that, like, if I take everything that's triggering about it out of it, it can't rap. And then just saying nigga shit, nigga shit is, it is funny in itself. But the purpose of it was to say that all they came here for, all they wanted you for, is insane. nigga shit. Like, it was, it was, mm-hmm. it was hitting it on the, the hammer... The hammer was hitting the nail right on the head. It was it was very like it was very like over like overzealous with it. Like they they didn't pull any punches. Like that was not any subtleness. It was basically saying, We are looking for you to entertain us with some nigga shit. So in the film, they manifested that by him saying nigga shit over and over again. So I like I I felt the same thing that you felt, but I also look at that from a, a film perspective and think that is as great, like I thought that was Bro, just a great choice to do things. But I literally felt what Jamie Foxx said about fucking Hollywood 
when he got invited to that party. Like when they make you sell your soul at the door, mm-hmm. like to get in these parties and to get into these rooms. And I'm like, yo, this gotta be what dudes feel like and why why Cat Williams went crazy and, and, and the list goes on and on about, you know, when people get this level of fame that they lose their shit because they see shit that's not normal to them or not what they signed up to be just to be famous or do what they do. Um, they do this to and, everyone. But here's the thing, to people of color, to women, it's much worse. Because to mm-hmm. a straight male, I may have to go in there and be like nigga shit and, and make myself look like uh, a fucking, be cooning it up for these white people. But a woman, white woman or black woman, they may have to go in there and fuck that nigga. <laughs> like, they may yeah. have to go in there and pretend to let this nigga fuck him. Like, you don't know. Like, get raped, get sexually assaulted. Like, flirt with Why him. Steamed? Like, you don't know. Like, it... They do this to people, and it's it's the Hollywood culture that's fucked up. And as much as, and here's the thing, Me Too is not going as far as nearly as the assholes saying that it is, and I wish it would. But I do think that it's doing something to at least make cert- some people just double check some of these things. Just double check some of this shit. It ain't fixing it. This shit's still going to happen. But if it saves one woman from getting sexually assaulted, you know, then that's a good, I mean, that's. That's something I can, you know, live with, right? So, oh like, yeah, influences that exec for not not trying to put a, 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 a actress in that position and try to further her career and actually do it on the, her merit and not, you know, try to fuck her right. and try to, you know, tell her some shit. Yeah, it's not done. here's something that here's something that again, when I was watching it because that was right after the nigga shit part, and I was kind of my eyes were like wide, like oh okay. Y'all notice that when he was sitting in that back room and Mr. Blank came back there to talk to him in the party to mm-hmm. say that Arn Hammer was waiting for him. He uses black voice? No, no, not that. Not yeah, that. That's real, though. Not, not that. As he's walking, as Mr. Blank is walking down and their camera's panning down, it shows all these women having sex mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. these dudes. Mm-hmm. And right he before- had to say nigga shit, nigga shit, nigga, nigga, nigga shit. The women had to give up their bodies. Exactly. That's exactly what I was saying. Is There's levels to this shit. And that was on purpose. And before that, mm-hmm. they foreshadowed it because Lyft said, these cunts are here all the time. You're going to fuck something or something like that. Like He was basically telling them this when he got there. But uh, before we get to that, so that brings me to the point where I wanted to get to before we go down this chronologically. In the background, uh, while in the beginning of the part of the movie, this in the background, whenever they're traveling through Oakland, or they're walking down the street or something, you're seeing signs and commercials for this company uh, called Worry Free. Free. And it's basically like modern-day slavery, right? I mean, that's exactly what it is. Like, it's not slavery. And as far as we can tell, it's not slavery like you and Chains and I'm whipping you, but it's slavery and you sign lifetime contracts with this company. You don't get paid. They do give you a place to live, quote-unquote, and they give you food, quote unquote, and you don't have to worry about paying any bills, but you ain't getting paid. You can't go anywhere. You got to live there. You're working 14, 15 hours a day. You're sleeping. They were sleeping two to a bunk bed on each bunk. If they were married, yeah. So they were sleeping like eight, four people to a bunk bed, and they had like two sets of bunk beds in a room, so eight people in a room, all jumbled up in a room on top of each other. And you're seeing these commercials all over like, promoting this shit and you're watching this and you're like this is really like on the nose and exaggerated but is it really exaggerated right like you hear that amazon doesn't pay people a living wage now is amazon making you sign a lifetime contract and bumping you up no but it might feel like that when you don't have nothing else and you got to go work for this place it's not going to pay you a living wage but you know you can't just go quit because there's no really other options for you to go to so it was basically taking that notion of like these companies no, they can afford to pay people more because the executives and managers are living large. And so it's one of those things where if I'm a CEO and I make $50 million a year and so I pay my people minimum wage or I pay my people low wages, I, what if I made $25 million a year? I could take that other $25 million, put it into wages, and everybody lives a good life, and I'm still rich as fuck, right? But people at the top don't think like that. And this film did a good job of expressing that. Arnie Hammer plays the owner of uh, Worry Free. His name is Steve Lift. 
and he's basically like this white rich dude who speaks as if he's not running a slave company. <laughs> He's acting <laughs> as if he's like, well, we're giving people opportunities. And then they even give it to the point where at one point, uh, Cassius' his uncle, who he lives with, is like, look, man, I can't pay this shit, man. If I get kicked out, I don't know what to do. And he was like, but I've been seeing these commercials and these posters for worry-free, and they don't look that half bad. And that's exactly what happens in real life. You look at people like McDonald's that don't pay people, and then you go, well, you know, I'm not doing shit. I could go work at McDonald's, right? I could go do this and get taken advantage of. And I thought that it was over the top. And I think that some people, specifically white people, are going to see that and think, oh, this is over the top silly thing. But in reality, I thought it was like so on the nose about like corporate greed. What do you guys think? You hit the nail on my head, man. You really explained it very well. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so that's happening in the background. So back to the main story. Cassius gets that white voice. He starts making sales to sale to sale to sale. Nigga, you said Cassius like shit. His name is Cassius. <laughs> Cassius. Oh, Cassius. And then um, he basically, you meet Stephen Wynn's character, Stephen Young's character, Squeeze. And he shows up. He's there working. He's like, look, let me, let me holler at you. And he's like, this is what's <laughs> happening. We ain't getting paid shit. This is fucked up. They got plenty of money. We need to form a union so we can have rights and benefits for everybody here. And Cash is, while he's still a regular telemarketer, he's on board, 100% on board. And they're all on board, and Tessa Thompson works there, and she's participating. And she's kind of like a rebel and a radical outside. Uh, she does, like, uh, different types of protests. No, she, stop right there. So, like, the thing about it is Tessa didn't start working there until, you know, uh, Cash was like, boom, you know, I put a word in for you because he's doing so good. You should come, you know, work part time for us. So it's a hustle like, yo, come get this money. But at the same time, like what squeeze is to tell everybody is this motherfucker is like uh, a moving scab. Like this nigga stay going, setting up uh, unions in places or fighting mm-hmm. for unions and shit. And you don't even know that in the, in, the, in the background of the story that this is what he does. He's a whole rebel rouser. Like he's trying to, you know, I guess. Uh, ignite the revolution. So I mean, it, it's cool, but it's more. It was layers to that shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that's like what everybody he, in there was looking to come up for something. Mm-hmm. And I really enjoyed that because, like, Tessa Thompson's character is presented as like the voice of reason for a lot of part of this movie, and and his conscience. But she's also like, when that nigga got rich and bought his Tesla and moved to the nice ass law, she was right there with him, riding right that did. Tesla, living in that fucking bed, no problem. Until it reached a point, right? Because everybody had another thing. This movie is explaining is that everybody has their line, right? Everybody, we talk about everybody it. Everybody has a price. Everybody, everybody has a price, and everybody has a line where you draw, right? So some people's line is further ahead than other people, right? Some people, you say one racist thing, they're they're already out the paint for you. Trying uh, to cancel you. Other you people, did. it's like, I mean, I don't agree with that shit, but I'm not writing them out the paint for that. And then, but the, your line is if he says nigger, so he can say like. He could call Chinese people stuff. He could he could say gay slurs. You okay with that? But when he says nigger, that's the line, right? It crossed the line. And for Tessa, the line was when he told him he was working and selling shit for we work. I mean, for uh, worry free. He was like, uh, she was like, yeah, that's the line. I'm not crossing. And he no, said, it's when he broke the picket line, though. That's what it really was. Well, well, before, but when she was talking to him, she was like. Yo, you're selling stuff to worry free, like dog. That's fucked up. But she w- she wouldn't have known that shit had he not broke the picket line. And he, when the first time he broke the picket line is when he got rocked, and then that's what she w- he was telling her about what he actually sells. You know what I'm selling? Oh yeah, so yeah, basically Squeeze presents this rev- this uh, walkout, and they all strike. And certain the power callers though. So at this point. Cassis has been moved upstairs to the power car. By the way, that part was funny. That goddamn elevator. And but here's Yo, the thing: that white bitch. <laughs> Yo, that that shit fucked me up a little bit because I didn't know to take it as like you trying to fuck a black dude because he's rich. Like you know he falls into that that category of an athlete or well to do motherfucker. Because she started lusting after that man as soon as they got in the elevator. As soon as that shit opened, and and it wasn't the first time she had hinted this shit. When he got close, when they when they got um, close to be even talking, being a, becoming a power caller, she had started to feel that way and look at him that way. 
So I didn't even know how I felt about that shit. But they also had the elevator like playing to your toxic masculinity, right? Because the elevator was right. basically like, oh, if I wasn't a computer, I'd come down there and suck your dick. You're the most, you're the strongest man, the smartest man. You're about to make these phone calls. I'm like, yo, what is this? But then again, it's like, you know, sometimes a lot of men, you know, they get, you know, they get motivated by that shit, right? So they had the power calls that were upstairs. They had their own private elevator, and they were crossing the picket line because they were making so much bread. And all the people downstairs where cash had started, and Stephen Young and his homeboy Salvador, they were all like, "Like, no, nah, man, we're striking. We're trying to get this. We're trying to get a living wage. Trying to get some benefits. We just want to. We ain't trying to ask for everything. We just want something, right? And and so that's where you look at like what was interesting about Danny Glover's character is that Langston is that he had the white voice down too. But he ain't never achieved the level that Cass Cassius achieved. So part of that, when he was looking at him, it was like, he was like, oh, you going to be a power caller? He was like, I'm going to be a power caller. And then he was like, yo, they told me that shit too. They ain't about that shit. So part of that was like, Cassius is actually better at this than you are. So you're a little mad at that. But also, it could be that, you know, I'm just trying to live. I'm not trying to, I don't need everything, right? Danny right. Glover's character is like, I don't need everything in the world. But I don't got to sell my soul. He kind of knew what the price was, and it wasn't worth that price. He can have a good life without selling his soul. Yep. Um, yeah, go ahead. But go ahead. So we're talking about selling your soul and 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 keep going back to Cassius and 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 Mr. Blank and how Langston had the white voice and didn't use it. And I, I think the one thing that you touched on earlier that I just want to really expound on more is how uh, everybody has a breaking point. Like I'll do this, but I won't do this. You, you could make jokes about the agent folks, but don't say nigga, nigga, nigga. Um, at the beginning of the movie, when he's trying to get the job, Cassius, mm-hmm. when he's trying to get the job, <laughs> He finds out that the reason why his application was falling through is because his boy that he put down as a reference on his job went behind his back and got the job before him. Mm-hmm. But then his boy turns around and has the nerve to be indignant about him taking the next step to get money to to, to better himself. Wow. And at the end, he has no problem taking the Tesla that he's offering him. No problem. So it's Maserati. like the, the Maserati. So these are all levels like uh, smoke, Steve. What? What? Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. Um, is doing all of this righteous stuff for the union, like trying to build the union, and we're gonna shut this down and all that. But at the same time, he's dirty macking on Ooh. Tessa Thompson. That mm-hmm. shit made me mad. How, how do y'all like, feel about that? How, how do y'all both feel? Well, here's the thing: I was, I wasn't as mad because he was basically like flirting with her a little bit but he wasn't really going there and the reason why i didn't get mad is because how they wrapped it up right because i would agree with you if they if they did that typical thing where now he's mad because basically what happens is tessa uh cassius we were talked about earlier when she was mad at him she's like look if you cross that picket line one more time we it's a rat with us and he crossed Mm -hmm. that picket line and she was like it's a rat i'm done with you and then Uh, that night she was like she was already pissed at him, and she went, she did her her art show, and she had already had a good relationship with Squeeze because if we're being wait, honest, wait before yeah. that when she was standing on the corner twirling the sign when she was waiting for him to come pick her up. Yeah, before the before the picking the first day he became a power car. Yeah. Yes, he came over to her job twirling signs and started trying to hit on her. Yeah, he was hitting on her then, but he was like he wasn't he wasn't a, he wasn't like he was hitting on her, but I wouldn't say he was like going OD. He was just like trying to feel her out. Like, cause I think at that point he didn't really know Cassius that much. So I took it as he was like, I'm trying to see how serious these uh, they really are. So then at the art show, they broken up, and basically Tessa like he's like there. He's like, oh, you did a good job, blah 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 blah. And you could tell he's like feels her, but and to an extent like he. I guess he feels like he might be closer to her because he's more radical, quote unquote, than Cassius, and she's more of a radical. And so she's basically like, she's probably felt that too, so she just started kissing him. And then they kind of, they didn't have sex, but they kind of did this thing. 
So then they did everything but sex. And yeah, she so said it. They had this conversation um, with Cassius. Hold on. And um, Cassius was like, uh, what'd you do? She's like, yeah, we did everything but sex. And then she was like, do you want me to know? And I thought this was a good thing in the film yeah. where he was like, no, nah, I don't really want to know. It's cool. And no, yeah, no, they handled it very maturely. Right, they right, handled right. it very well. But this um, is what I was going to get to. The What made me, because I would agree with you, but what made me not be so on that point is after that, when uh, Cassius and Tessa, I mean, Detroit, her name was Detroit in the movie, got back together and they were in front of Squeeze and they started embracing and kissing. He didn't go full like, fuck you, bitch. I really liked you or fuck you, Cassius or blah, blah, blah. He was basically like, all right, they really love each other. All right, then. And kind of right. moved on. I think he judged the position like, you know, like, that, I mean, that was the one time thing we had a moment. Yeah. So I didn't look at him as like trying to get a come up on his girl. No, I was talking about from from Detroit though. Like you know, what I mean, that was kind of some fuck shit. But I mean, like I dig it. I mean, they were broken like, up. Yeah, just, I, I just because he look, just because he knew what time it was and that they were gonna stay together, doesn't mean that he didn't try and dirty max somebody he was claiming was his friend. Right. That's true. Thank you. That's true. No matter what you say, like if we meet and I go to the bathroom and you turn to my wife and you're like, yo. <laughs> how you like how how you liking being with Rashani? You know, hey, you and me have the same mindsets or whatever. Just because then, y'all don't do anything, like, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't mean that you didn't make the attempt. So, right. um, he shot his shot. He landed the shot. It just didn't resonate. And the other thing that got me about Detroit, which, again, I I, I enjoyed this movie, but I enjoyed it from a different aspect and everybody else i didn't see it as a comedy i saw it kind of like real life and that's what i'm trying to get across is that it wasn't a thing where i was like i don't see yeah yeah right humor i saw the humor i just saw other things like for instance did y'all notice that when she was when when it was time for detroit's art show she did her voice with a white voice yes yeah yes yeah that shit and that shit made me mad i was like i was like yo how the fuck you be a whole hypocrite yo but that was Everybody I thought that was like the whole thing of it though. But I was just talking about from her, like, yo, how dare you? Yeah, but and, that and, yeah, but and, and um fucking Cash has even told her that you do the same thing for the rich wife before she actually yeah, did it. They yeah, they foreshadowed it. Like that's what I love about this movie is that like I said, everybody has to make that choice, right? Everybody and whatever they do, you can be woke in one way and not in another way, right? Like the thing with Charlemagne, like with Angela Rye. Angela Rye is broke as shit when it comes to race, but they get up there talking about her boy Charlemagne and raping that girl, and she was right back to, "That's my brother. He ain't do it." Blah blah blah. Girls do this. You gotta dress this way. All that shit type shit, right? Everybody ain't woke on everything, and everybody right. makes compromises. And it's just a level in which you do that shit, right? And you and it's when you start judging other people on it, there's certain things you can judge other people on it. So like everybody in this film, even Cassius was like, "Yo, I don't fuck with uh, uh, what's that shit? Worry free." Like even when he was selling shit there, he's like, "No, this shit is fucked up," right? But he mm-hmm. made the calculation that I'm I'm removed enough from worry free that I am okay with what I'm doing and my contribution to worry free. Where I can live with myself, but he still realized that it was fucked up. But he made that calculation in his mind. And here's another thing. Here's another one of those examples. When the people, when the telemarketers were protesting, and Cassius crossed the picket line, the girl threw a coke bottle at him, right, and fucked him up. And it got on YouTube. <laughs> that shit was funny. And it got on YouTube. That shit was funny. And they replaying that shit over and over and over and over again. <laughs> Made a goddamn Halloween costume. And it got like 10, like millions and millions of views, right? So the girl who's supposed to be here fighting for what's right, fighting for the, everybody else, I'm here for the fucking, so I want <laughs> I want my people to make money and I want telemarketers to be respected. She got a little bit of fame and said, fuck this shit, I'm out. Got a TV and show. Find a, yep. <laughs> and everything. Because at the end of the day, I I support you, but uh, you think I'm about to pass up this bread to be out here picking it? <laughs> Fuck no! <laughs> and she went and got she capitalized on that little bit of fame because some people just want that fame, right? So it, and it and it, it got her famous, and that was and another thing that this film we'll talk about is I loved how they portrayed the media, right? When he turned on the TV, 
It's the news talking about this shit from such a removed perspective. Because you're watching that, you'd be like, yo, the news should be like, worry free is fucked up. It's modern day slavery and reporting it like hardcore like that. When in reality, they're just talking about it. Like it's just a company. Just like when you, you turn on CNN. Like I watch a ton of news and a ton of politics. And I know I shouldn't, but I just do. Cause I, as much as I know it's fucked up, I still just want to know what the fuck's going on and what people are saying. Yeah. And I watch that shit, and they talk about shit so removed, even when you know they know it's wrong, right? So like, e- And even when they're condemning it, they're condemning it from such a perspective of an arm length away, right? So like, even when Trump was saying that shit about Charlottesville, I don't watch Fox News, so I don't know what the fuck they were saying. But on on CNN and MSNBC, there was nobody on there, no anchors on there defending that motherfucker. They were all saying that it was wrong. But then they would still bring on the Trump supporter and be like, do you think what the president said is racist? Even though you just got done doing a segment saying that it was fucked up, right? Or just just like yes, two days ago when he did that shit with Russia, the anchors, I saw... Uh, Anderson Cooper, well, he wasn't like this, so I'm not going to nail him, but Anderson Cooper came on, he was like, his opening statement was like, this is one of the most disgraceful things in, in foreign relations that a president has done in modern history. Like, that's how he opened his fucking show, right? So other people were saying stuff like that, and then they would bring on Trump supporter A, and then be like, so what do you think about what the president did, right? And then they presented as like this this equal argument when it's like, no. There's one answer to this shit. What are you There's talking about? Answer. There's one answer. There's one answer. So they do that, it's right? It's treasonous shit. And then they had the fucking game show, which is just, what was it called? Slap the shit, out, the shit out of me. Kick no, the kick shit the out, out of me. me. Which is basically an uh, allegory for people go on TV and they embarrass the fuck out of themselves, whether it's reality TV, whether, you know, it was, I think it was basically a spit from reality TV. So whether it's like yeah. VH1, Love & Hip Hop, or it's, uh, Real Housewives, or it's, uh, Real World, or any of those shows, white or black, where the people are on there doing ridiculous shit, making themselves a fool out of to be Will stars. Will to exploit themselves for, for a little bit of fame, yeah. That's what people, and that's the highest rated show on television, which a lot of these reality shows are the highest rated show on television. But then you flip it on the other side and you go, well, if this is what people want to see, somebody should provide this content, Right. Who? Why should I, if I can provide this content and I can make money off this in the capitalist society, why shouldn't I? What else am I going to do? Anything else I'm going to do is going to have issues too. So I really love how they portrayed the media and balanced that shit as well. What do you guys think? Ah, go ahead, Sonny. Nah, go for it. Go for it. Uh, I just thought it was crazy that Cash just knew that shit. He was like, man, whatever I got to do so y'all can play this clip, I'll do like he knew, he already knew what time it was, but still went through it just for them to show that clip. Oh, like so that yeah. shit. Let's get to that. that. So this is where the movie turns sci-fi, right? <laughs> and I'm gonna admit to some for some people, hilarious. This is going to be too far, right? This is going to be like this is too ridiculous. Yeah. But I took it as not literal, but figuratively, this is exactly what companies would do in real life. Oh, if yeah, they no. Could. So, <laughs> not literally, but this is exactly what companies were doing, yeah. right? So, essentially, he, uh, Mr. Blank, by the way, uh, so before we get to that, Amari Hardware's character is, he's like I mean, the head of the power callers. He's like the top power caller, and he has a super white voice as well. Uh, and that was played by Patton Oswalt, and he's basically like, um, hyping cashes up, and then he tells him that, you know, Steve Lift, the head of, Worry Free wants to meet you. So before we get to that, uh, Rashani, what do you think? Why do you think they made they kept bleeping out his name? Do you think there was a meaning behind that? Yeah, it didn't fucking matter to anybody. Yeah, he was nobody. Back to, yeah. It, and he 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 told him straight out, yo, you know what? Nothing I do here in the long run of things matters. I am not important. Y'all thought I was important downstairs because you saw me get on that elevator. I don't even have a name. And it showed when he got into the party and the dude was just like denigrating him over and over again. Basically like, shut the fuck up, dude. Why are you even talking to me? Yeah, you're only here because of Cassius. I, like, I only let you here because I want to talk to him. Exactly. And also, I think it was because he's been doing that white voice so long and he's been this different person for so long. And he lost himself. He's no longer the, the, he's, to- I mean, the, uh, the precious nigga anymore. He's like, no, the precious black no he's no longer himself. He's mm-hmm. he's yeah. something. He's an amalgamation of 
all the things that people around him want him to be, which is nothing. <laughs> uh, Very so true. They get him to go to this party that Steve Lips has, and like Rashani said earlier, there's a bunch of women there who are basically there to like just for their bodies and for their sex. And there's two black people. There's Amari Howard's character, Mr. Blank, and there's Cassius. And they're walking around getting the tour shit. And then that's when they did the uh, rap for us. I know you can. No, first, before that, they go, uh, you're from Oakland. Tell us about the hood. And he's like, I don't, I don't know what you want me to say. And he's just basically st- like giving a fucking speech standing in front of all these white people. And they're like, tell us about the hood. Tell us about what, is, what black's life is like. And uh, we've all been there. We've all I'll been in that there. situation. Especially like. Like Devin and I went to white, predominantly white colleges. Like you've been there, and in the, in some cases, like the white people. I mean, I'm not here to like defend white people, but in so some you got of the a cases, whole different background because you're from Baltimore. Like you went to school in Baltimore. I say Virginia Beach to people, and they're like, oh, "Okay, cool." They they still want to know what they want to know about Norfolk. You know, oh, isn't that where Pharrell's from? Isn't that from where Eclipse are from? Uh, is it really like that? I mean, like. Yeah, I get those questions, but like when I say Virginia Beach, for the most part, people understand. I tell people really up front, I come from the middle class of Virginia Beach, and don't get it twisted. I I don't know nothing about that life, I, and I thank my parents every day of the week that I don't know nothing about that life. And I, when I say I'm from Baltimore, people go, "Wow, is, is it safe? Do you know anybody that died?" Like, <laughs> like they just, you know, because they hear they know Baltimore from that, right? And so, oh, it. Is it where the wire? Yeah, the wire. Oh, yeah, you get that a lot. <laughs> the wire yeah. is a lot. Uh, and so then at that point, he, he does that. Then he does the rap and shit. And so then Steve Lift brings him. Then uh, Mr. Blank tells him to go to his office. And he goes to Steve Lift's office. And he's like, all right, I got this proposal for you. He's like, I want you to watch this video. And he's like, yo, I can't. And it, before that, he makes him sniff a line of, quote, cocaine. Right? This is key. It's, so it's 100% pure, man. 100%, 100% pure, pure cocaine. And he's like, yo, I got to piss. So he, he and he's like the bathroom is down the hall and the jade door, and so there's like two green colored doors. So he goes through the wrong green colored door and he walks through this bitch. First of all, you gotta know when the fuck you going down the goddamn corridor. That ain't the bathroom, yo. <laughs> so I, got, I was like, yo, it's like the fucking basement. What the fuck? You tell me what, what the fuck is going on? I got to go back the other way. This is the wrong door. And he like, gets he gets to the end and he hears these people like, help me, help me. And he fucking pulls the curtain back, and it's motherfucking horse people. No, no, he thought he pulled the, the stall door open and thinking the dude like needed help. And he and fell then he out the and changed. Door, and then yeah, and it's a fucking horse person, like a literal a fucking horse dick. That shit was cr- first of all, that shit was distracting. As f- I was like, what? Why the fuck is they? They're naked though, and he has a whole stick, and it's it's like this is gonna be problematic. For a lot and, of but it's hilarious for some people. It's just gonna be like, yo, this is ridiculous, right? And All right, you said dick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 Damn, horse dick. And, yeah. and then other people are gonna be like, "This is too extreme." And then, but for me, I I'm a sci-fi guy, so I was like, "Okay, I I can get with a little sci-fi into this shit." Yeah. And so then he goes back, and then uh, Steve Lift runs in there, right? And he's like, "I told you, to go through the wrong door." And Cash is just like, what the fuck, yo? He's like, fr- like freaking the fuck out. Like, what the fuck? Am I, am I high as shit? Like, what the fuck is this? And then he goes back, and he's like, just watch the video. And so they put on this animated video, and it's basically like, back in the beginning times, uh, prehistoric people, they figured out that, you know, we can use tools to make us better, but we still can evolve. And so now why not make a tool that can help us evolve? And so then they show, like, this guy taking a snort or something, and then he turns into this fucking horseman. And then Cash just flips the fuck out like, what the fuck did you give me? Why am that I not high? That was the coolest part of everything, yo. Why that the, the fuck am I not high? And he's like, calm the fuck down, man. You're not turning into a horse person. Calm the fuck down. And he calms him down. And then he shows him the rest of the video. And it's basically what Worry Free is doing, what Steve Lift is doing, is they come up with this formula that you can sniff it and it'll turn a person and make him taller, bigger, stronger, and half horse, right? So, and it basically, the point of it is, is that if we turn people into horse people, we can, we can do triple the amount of work with less people, right? So we can, because everybody's stronger, they can work longer, and they can do all this shit at a higher rate and more efficiently, and it'll make the best thing for business ever. And the, and the equal sapiens don't have rights yet, so shit. And they don't have no rights, and so we can really slave them to fuck. 
and nobody has to know about this. And he's like, I want you to be their Martin Luther King. <laughs> what he said that to shit him. fucked me up. And here's the thing. A lot of people were like, why? I just read some reviews and they were like, I don't know why they had to show the dick or keep talking about the dick. But to me, that was a big part of it for me because he kept talking yeah. about, and you get to have a big ass dick. And I'm like, dude, do you know right, how many people, do you know how many men in this world, not turn into a horse, that's the extreme, but that's the point of it, it's, it's, it's to the extreme. But do you know how many men in this world, if you told them, yeah, I want you to take this experimental drug that's going to help me do bigger. this, but you're going to get a big ass dick. You can't. You know how many men would do that? That I, shit would fly off the fucking shelves, yo. A lot of men would do that shit, right? So them focusing on the dick to me was the thing just saying, look how fucking toxic men are like they're they don't give a fuck what happens to them or what happens to other people if they can just get a bigger dick and, uh, and sex more women right so he basically and then he's like i'm gonna offer you a hundred million dollars to do this for five years and then i'm gonna give you this cure but he says the cure like he just made it up out of his fucking brain because it didn't exist and Cassius <laughs> was like he's like sleep on it and he's like all right then i'm gonna go sleep on it right and so then he couldn't find his phone and he finds this message and uh Tessa Thompson's character is like, I thought you were trying to get a booty call. Like, fuck me. So I didn't even look at your message. And so she's like. But still got the pussy, though, before. Yeah, that was, I was, I was awesome. He's like, we can't do this anymore. Still got the sex after. No, that was after like, that. She came in. I mean, that's still, no, no, no. That was uh, when, when she first met him. When, when they met up, they met back up that morning. They had sex then. And then she was like, I thought it was weird that you text me. She's like, well, play that shit. Oh, yeah, so they play that shit, and it's basically like the horse people got the phone, and they're, like, recording a message, like, help us, help us, help us. And then Steve Lift comes in there and is like, get back in there before I turn you to fucking glue. <laughs> and, that shit was no good. And so here's another thing about the media and about politics, how they brought this in. So he goes on that show, kick the shit out of you, just to get his message, because he knows that's the biggest audience in the world. And so they beat the fuck out of him, and then they make him take a bath and shit. And he's sitting there looking fucking miserable as fuck. And it's like, and you're looking at him and it's like, this is like what you got to do for fame or to get your message out. And it's an extreme example, but it's almost like what you got to do to get your message out today for some people. And then he gets the message out and it's all over the country. And what are the people saying? Is this wrong? Like, <laughs> uh, debate this. Is worry free going you, to, yeah, yeah, is, if worry free is wrong. Yeah, is yeah. worry free going too far? And then what fucking happens? Wall Street goes... Motherfucker, you're making horse people. You're going to do twice as much work with the least amount of people. Why the fuck you on us? <laughs> like, Nigga, this is great. Man, this is going to make us more money. Let me invest. My man Steve Lift became the richest man in the world overnight and shit. Like, like in, in, it's, a, it's an extreme. Not only that, you that know? nigga hit God status. Like, people yeah. were out there like, yeah, he's our Jesus. And here's the thing. They had the, the signs up when, when he walked past the, the religious dude holding up the sign saying that, he was Jesus and all that kind of stuff. And he took the sign from him and ran off. Yeah. Man. It, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. We are so blind to the fact that when we say that we want more opportunity, that we want more uh, money, that we want more insurance, whatever we're saying we need, what we're giving up in return is our bodies. We're giving up ourselves. Um, and it's like, what are you willing to do for that money? Like people, when he said, I'll, for five years, I'll give you $100 million and eh, I'll give you an antidote. <laughs> people, you, like you said, people would have really jumped at that because people are just thinking about what can I do to take care of myself? How can I keep in this same situation? And then they get themselves into that place and they're like, yo, somebody just killed me help me. I can't take this. I can't handle this. And, and, and that's what I saw at that point. Yeah. It was sci-fi. Yeah. It was supposed to be comedy. Yeah. It was supposed to be I like that turn though. I honestly did like that turn though. Me too. And I, it was, I, it was and, going down a rabbit hole. I didn't want to go down to like, I was going to internalize some things if it kept going down that road and for they to, to lighten it up with the sci-fi joint, it, it, it kept me engaged. And I mean, I mean, when, when I'm saying these things, I'm not saying it like I didn't like it. I'm just saying it like it was, something else that just struck me right. like we're gonna work y'all like workhorses we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> it, it wasn't like they were saying black folks or anything like that they were talking about humanity society yeah like y'all are really i didn't even think that they were horses i didn't 
I thought they were I thought they were jackasses. I thought they were donkeys. Really, because they showed the horse underneath that swirly, the swirl of cocaine that he sniffed. I thought that was a donkey. So I thought they were saying that y'all are gonna be our work mules. Mr. Bobo, yeah. yeah. Hey, y'all are straight up asses. Y'all are jackasses for taking on this role. And it just all struck me in a place where I was like, this is something that I will sit there and think about for a long time, but it's not something I'm going to laugh at because I could see this happening. If people could pull this off, that stock really would go through the roof. That shit's real. Absolutely. That shit was so real. Absolutely. And, and, and people he, would uh, worship them. Exactly. That's great. And then, like, the shit... And he knew he took that goddamn shit. Because he was like, he's like, Detroit, look at my dick. Did it get bigger? And my nostril bigger? That shit was hilarious. Because mm-hmm. he was like, yo, he gave me some shit. Yo, that shit was wild. And then he fucking went back and he realized that he'd gone too far. And he joined, he crossed back across the picket line and joined the protesters. And he talked to his old high school people. And I thought that was interesting too, because we all know the people who still live in high school. And oh, I know. <laughs> And then they got them, and he got the horse, broke the horse people out, and they stopped the people from being able to cross the line, and they got their fucking raise. And then uh, everything seems to be happy. And and here's the thing: this is where like Get Out changed the ending because the original ending for Get Out was that nigga got arrested <laughs> mm-hmm. at the end of the film, and but they changed it to make it a happy right, ending. Yeah. But um, in this film, at after all that, at the end of the day. And they played it for laughs, which is okay. But at the end of the day, he was lying, and that motherfucker turned into a horseman. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then the end credits was everything. After those end credits, that shit now was that part everything. was funny because that's exactly what would happen. You turn me to a fucking horseman, I'm coming to fuck you up, motherfucker. <laughs> what else I got Dick to live for? I'm a horseman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yo, when they ran in there, like, one of the, the dicks fucking came up high. I was like, what the? Yo, because you can't run with a dick that big. You just can't. So some like, lighter moments about this film. Um, another another one of my favorite uh, stars in this film was uh, Tessa Thompson's uh, booty. Because that was yes. uh, very prominent in this film. And to be equal opportunity, you did see Lakeith Stanfield's booty uh, at one point, too. Yeah, that was. But they made a point to put her front and center many times and I wasn't angry. Um, Shout out for her for not showing her titties on, on, on screen. And they I read that this film was actually shot in Oakland on mm-hmm. not in any sets, just literally every place they shot it at was no, none of those were movie sets. They were all real places. Those bars were real bars that people go to in Oakland. The street was a real neighborhood in Oakland. Like they shot this movie in Oakland. Uh, on some real shit, did you realize like how many fucking shanty towns that you saw and how many tent towns you saw on that, which was also for, I mean, you know, background as far as what the current situation is. People are trying to make it, but it's still hard. You know, like there's a lot of homeless people there, yo. Yeah, and I'm not from the Bay Area. Rashani's close to that area. I, I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, it, it's real. And a lot of people, I read some people who were from the area and they said it felt very Oakland. Like the movie mm-hmm. felt very Oakland. So, I mean, the only thing that would have made it feel even more Oakland is if, I mean, because they had the niggas out there with them crazy looking bikes. Uh, they had the niggas out there with the uh, rolling in scrapers and laughing at people who, when they trip and fall in the middle of the street instead of helping them out, like everything was Oakland. It, it was. And it, it was it was wonderful. Like there was so much beauty in this movie that you just forget. Well, you don't forget that there's a ton of ugly. There's a ton of ugly, and it's just like, okay, we're laughing through the pain, but at the same time, don't lose sight of the fact that this shit is fucked the fuck up. Mm-hmm. They want um, you to laugh through the pain. That's exactly what that, and is. and that's that's exactly what they keep saying. Like right now, where we're at in in society, they're like, yo, let's yeah, Trump is doing horrible stuff, but he's giving Saturday Night Live stuff to talk about, and it's like right. Stephen Gobert kills it every night, every night. Exactly, you do. Uh, Seth, Seth Myers and they're doing great and it's like y'all are not seeing what I'm seeing here like this is bigger than that and I feel like at that point that's what uh, Darius or, or golly Cassius. <laughs> Cassius was going through in that he was trying to tell people what he saw what he experienced and everybody was like nah man 
I don't see that. Right now, I'm focused on getting this strike so I can get this money. So even in their own way, everybody else is still about getting money. Mm-hmm. Like, he's trying to tell them what's going on, and he's, they're like, nah, man, we got to focus on getting this strike done so then we can get the money that everybody else is getting. So nobody's looking out for anything past that bottom line in this movie. Right. Nobody. And, and Such is life, though. Such is life. The, the, part that, the part that really stuck out to me was where Detroit was doing her um, art show. And she was like, I'm going to stand up here and I'm going to do the line from... The Last Dragon. The Last Dragon. And y'all can throw sheep's blood and and and, and cell, phones. cell phones and all this stuff at me as you wish. And that first cell phone, like they didn't make it happen too much with that first cell phone where it literally doinked off her forehead. I was like, golly, like this is really where we're at right now. Like... I'm going to do something. Whatever. It's, it's crazy. And so I'm going to be this. a spectacle while y'all just completely humiliate me for the good of absolutely nothing. And in that scene, what's interesting about that scene is I was listening to uh, the MTR Network's review, and Shanna, she lives in Oakland, and she was actually an extra at that scene. And uh, basically, they told them, I want y'all to throw shit at Tessa Thompson for this scene. <laughs> So they were actually throwing it like that shit was actually happening, hitting her in the face of shit and throwing shit at her in that scene. Like they really got in, in the car. That was a real art gallery with a real mm-hmm. artist and all that shit. So I really like how they just brought that down to earth for the people, like a real down to earth mo- movie. That's also really outlandish, but also bigger than what it is. Um, anything else you guys got before we score this? Nah, we, we, we went long with this one, yo. We, we, we dive deep. This is, this is good. Uh, yeah, one more thing. Uh, I, I did want to point out how seedy and nasty the managers were in that call center. Oh, I forgot uh, about that. They are like that. Oh, Diane yo, Debauchery. Like, like Rick and Morty? The, the, yes. And, and, and those managers in call centers really are like that. Like, why the fuck am I here? Uh, I just need you to lie. Um, your resume that that was one of the funniest parts to me was when they were talking about his resume at the beginning. Um, but he was like, I just I just need you to lie. Like when that nigga had the employee of the month thing that he made himself, that was hilarious to me. <laughs> that was that's good, a good bro. way. That's a good way to open up the movie for me. Yeah. Um, because he was clutching it to his chest like it was an urn <laughs> of his mama. <laughs> Yo, did he not look like fucking Prince of Dave Chappelle? Every fuck like that shit fucked me up when he had the headband on. I was like, "Yo, he looks like fucking Prince." He's like, "Game blouses." I was just thinking about the whole time, yo. You got some this, pancakes. This movie is one of those movies that you don't have to see again. You don't, but it's gonna certain things like as time goes on, certain things are just gonna resonate and they're gonna hit you. So, uh. We can go ahead and do the the numbers on this. Go ahead thing. and do it, yo. Give it to it. You started. I give it a nine, and that's what I was saying. I'm saying all this stuff about it, and y'all are gonna be like, he didn't like this movie. No, no, I knew you like this it. movie. Struck me in so many different places that I left out literally stunned, mm-hmm. like <laughs> shell shocked at I what I saw. Brandon was like that. I texted Brandon. I was like, I don't even know what I just saw, but it was good. <laughs> really good. good. And so when people are coming out like this is the funniest thing I ever saw, I was like, did we see the same movie? And that's oh, the no. beauty of this type of movie. When you two people can see two completely different things, that is art. That is yes. perfect. This movie was great. And it brought up so many questions. And it had so many troubling parts. And it had so many small things that you just, in passing, this movie was put together wonderfully for a for a first time guy to put this out, this is amazing. The fact that he was able to get this cast and they were all able to act so they didn't oversell their parts. They all acted like they were just downtrodden and beaten by society and by everything that's happening to them. And and it was just everything that happened in this movie had a purpose. Mm-hmm. Everything. And everybody was all in too. Like for acting wise, nobody phoned this in. And for no. those reasons, for everything that happened in this movie, this movie is not a comedy to me. I'm gonna say that again, but it is a work of art. Mm-hmm. I give it a solid nine. Well, well said. Well, definitely well said. Um, like I, 
again, I was super hyped. I'm just glad we got to push this uh, review a day back because I was sad because uh, we had crazy shit going on at work yesterday and I couldn't record when you guys were doing the movie reviews um, for Skyscraper. And I was just like, man, this is going to be great um, because I just left in awe of the movie I just saw because I didn't know where to put it. I didn't know what genre to place it in. But I, the messages in, in the and the detail was so strong and so visceral that you could relate to if you if you are just an aware adult, you can see this thing happen in society. And where are you at? Are you what side of the hamster wheel are you on? You know, are you the one running? Or are you the one watching the hamster run? You know, and I just didn't know that it was gonna be this good. And when it made that sci-fi turn, it it just made, it lightened it up to me to where I, I could take this in a vacuum and know that people are going to discuss this film for a long time. And, and if it does get that Oscar, you know, nod or just buzz, more people will see this and we'll have discussions on where we are as a society and what role do you play in society. And I love, like Rashani said, it is art. This is art at its highest level. And you have arts, you have the, the messaging with, with Detroit's earrings and you have the, the billboards in the background and you have the, the orgy and you have, you know, you know, Southern soul as far as black men uh, being over sexualized and we, and you have, you know, the, the price of fame and you have all these underlying themes. And this was just, like you say, it was art and it, it will be discussed for a long time. And I, I'm, I'm going to go with Rasani and uh, definitely do a nine. Because it is also entertaining, so I definitely uh, enjoyed it. Uh, I echo everything each of you guys said. I also um, really, really, I thought it, I still thought it was funny at times. Like there was still this movie didn't get so in the weeds for me that I couldn't laugh at parts of it because I still was able to laugh at parts of it. And and I really really enjoyed this film so much, and I'm I'm going to go see it again because. There's so much stuff in this film in the background, like her earrings. We didn't talk about this, but Tessa Thompson's earrings and the shirt she wears and the way the pictures change when you walk past it at different times in the movie. His dad, the billboards. Yeah, his picture, yeah. There's so many little things in this film that are just even add more to it that it it's just it's just a, a fantastic piece of work. And um mm-hmm. I give it a ten. I can like there's the one the only thing I could give it is that it's a little heavy handed, but that's the most I can say bad about it. I'm going to go see the movie again. I tell people to see it. And here's the thing. Black people are going to see one thing and white people are going to see another thing. And then some white people are going to see what the black person says and then Asian people are going to see another thing. But any this is not a black film. I mean, it's a black film, but it's not a black film in the sense that it's a black ass film, but it's a film that anyone can take something from it. Right you can get positiveness out of this film. If you're just a dude that's downhearted, having a hard time with your job, or trying to figure out what's life about, or what am I actually doing, or is money everything, or like you don't even have to see the race things or the class issues or the media issues. Everyone can take something from this film. And I'm, I'm afraid some people are going to take the wrong things for this film, or some people are going to look at it as all silly and a sci-fi but if you are a reasonably intelligent person, you will be able to take something from this film that shines a light on how life is in your life. Uh, and if a film can do that, it's amazing. Uh, so that is our review for Sorry to Bother You. Um, thank you guys for listening to the podcast. Uh, you can find us on, uh, actually you can find Rashani on the single simulcast, singlesimulcast.com. Uh, and follow Rashani at, at Rashani. Uh, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, anywhere you get your podcasts at. Uh, please leave us a five star review. It helps us out a lot. And we will be back soon. Thank you guys for listening. Like a movie, Cause mama keep falling in love. My life's like a movie. And I'm gonna keep smoking and drugs. My life's like a movie. Life's like a movie